It seems as though every day someone or something gets cancelled. It's always the same cycle: an outpouring of outrage, of attention, of support, of backlash to the support, and then we move on. It's a toxic thing that people are doing. Duh! Hey, duh! If you do anything wrong in your life, looking for people that are that are bad and looking for things that are wrong. When I find out about it, I'm going to try to take everything away from you. It's very toxic. People that talk about cancel culture never seem to shut the fuck up about.、It. He's right. A lot of people talk about the phenomenon of getting canceled and what it means for free speech, the exchange of ideas, for universities, the cultural and interpersonal fabrics of the United States, and even what it means to be an American—an identity arguably founded on the principle of unrestrained speech. But for a very long time, not just in the last few years, an overzealous ideology of free speech has taken hold, and. It's not really in the service of protecting a constitutional right for everyday American citizens. Instead, it is very much about making sure that those who hold power in this country, by virtue of the institutions they are a part of, their class, their race, or their gender, are never held accountable. That they are never held accountable for inaccurate, ahistorical speech that justifies policies and practices that rely on demonizing communities, meaning. Relying on feelings, not facts. By doing that, we are ignoring the very real ways in which Americans are having their free speech encroached upon in the courtrooms, on campuses, and in the streets. But is there such a thing as cancel culture? Are we really unable to say anything anymore without having mobs descend upon us for having a difference of opinion? Or is the reality a little more, dare I say it? Complicated and distracting us from greater threats to our freedom of speech. Welcome to Backspace, where we tell you how the story is told in the headlines, and then we think about how we can tell it a little differently. The central issue at the heart of any and all discussions of so-called cancel culture is that of free speech. Hundreds of thousands of words in the past five years have been dedicated to defining and explaining what cancel culture means, its real and imagined effects, who, if anyone, deserves to be canceled, and of course, the big question of what this means for the ability to simply say and believe what you want. Today, along with TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube contributors, the leaders of these discussions are podcast hosts, political commentators, comedians, news personalities, and anyone else who's loud and attracts attention. Someone is going to be offended by everything you say. Someone, somewhere in the world, will find what you say offensive. So what? Who cares? I think that social media is supercharging this in a way that, like, we can't even. Grasp, and it's very hard for those of us like me and you who want to protect free speech and liberty. It is a crisis for the general culture. It's a crisis whereby you can find people on the right and the left slowly being purged from positions of influence or from positions or platforms that they otherwise might have because they're violating the group norm. So who's next? Who will the cancel culture attack next? The most vocal podcasters leading cancel culture discussions seem content to decry its power to ruin someone's livelihood, while at the same time inviting on guests who have been canceled but are somehow doing well enough to remain platformed. Conservative politicians and pundits point to cancel culture as an attack on traditional beliefs, as a way to ostracize conservative voices from social media, and a sign of increasing political division. The left shut us down. Democrats straddle the narrative of cancel culture as a means by which people can be held accountable, while also discouraging condemning people all the time. And comedians have widely pointed to cancel culture as the main reason they can't be funny anymore, and not the stale, outdated punching down material they're still welcome to perform in multi-million-dollar stand-up specials. What happens is everybody gets safe, and when everybody gets safe and nobody tries anything, things get boring. So I see a lot of unfunny comedians. I see unfunny TV shows. I see unfunny award shows. I see unfunny movies. <laughs> Cause no one's, everybody's scared to like, you know, make a move. But arguably, worst of all, many news outlets have wholeheartedly and often uncritically turned cancel culture into a beat, 
which has the adverse effect of depriving meaning and nuance from the situations they report on. I'm told we're getting tremendous reaction to this. Has cancel culture gone too far? Tonight, Cuomo is hitting back, denying the allegations and decrying what he calls cancel culture. Some historians claim cancel culture is an evolved mechanism for keeping humans in check. That may be true, but the rise of social media has accelerated and weaponized it into an unforgiving cultural wrecking ball. And referring to cancel culture, Ellen said the culture today is one where you can't learn or grow, which is what humans are supposed to do. I really hate cancel culture, and I hate the whole boycott culture. There's an entire industry that's been created as a reaction to so-called cancel culture. Being canceled or claiming cancellation can be used as an ideological precursor to a career shift Claiming cancellation makes them a martyr, makes them dangerous, makes them extra worth listening to. They're the ones who are saying the things that no one else wants to hear. Think of names like Barry Weiss, Brett Weinstein, Andrew Sullivan, Rouse Douthat, Ben Shapiro, Joe Rogan, Bill Maher. All people in the media who've made themselves synonymous with a fight against what they would characterize as a culture of diminishing free speech that has been replaced with fundamentalist pearl clutching and bullying from, specifically, the left. And that's a key feature of how we talk about cancel culture, that it is something uniquely coming from the left, that it's primarily brown and black people on Twitter, or that it's people who list their pronouns in their bios, that it's overzealous college freshmen who just got their first non-ear piercing. It's easy to say, the woke police are online saying that you use the wrong pronoun, therefore you shouldn't do X, Y, Z, right? As opposed to a lot of these people are actually online and on the ground fighting for better working and existing conditions across the nation. We could talk about capitalism. We could talk about um, white supremacy, racism. We could talk about uh, sexism. We could talk about any of these kind of ideas that are, are really deeply entangled in American society, and they're very hard to push back at. So when people do this, they start to get some kind of credibility or some kind of attention. Uh, they become a threat, but they also become a, a, a target. Rarely, if ever, does cancel culture refer to actions and outrage by those on the right. Like when a young AP journalist was fired from her job after an aggressive right-wing online campaign unearthed how in college she wanted to free Palestine. Or when a Texas high school's first black principal was pushed out of his job because parents accused him of promoting, quote, the conspiracy theory of systemic racism and even reported private Facebook photos of him with his white wife. Where were the verbose think pieces on the societal impact and damage of cancel culture then? In July 2020, it was revealed that federal agents in unmarked vehicles were picking up protesters off of the streets of Portland. We didn't see any open letters lamenting state forces violating the First Amendment when using violence on civilians protesting police brutality. We don't get discourse creating essays on cultural warfare when the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement, a global nonviolent campaign against Israeli occupation, is being made illegal across the United States. Was the First Amendment not under threat in 2019 when the Senate passed the Combating BDS Act, an act that would uphold laws in almost 30 states barring working with anyone who supports the BDS movement? This anti-Israel crusade has waged economic war against the Jewish state by pushing com companies around the world to boycott any business with Israel or its entities. Where are the countless columns, essays, reports, and broadcast segments dedicated to how students and scholars have been persecuted for their support of Palestinian human rights and statehood. Cancel culture only seems to exist when people from certain demographics or people associated with one particular end of the political spectrum express outrage and go after those with institutional and social power. No matter where the issue comes from on the political spectrum, the lens of power can really help us see what's going on. And by and large, it is not left-wing anti-racist undergraduates, even in their dozens or hundreds, it is not anti-racist activists on social media, you know, trying to, to live on GoFundMes and Patreons who have the power, right? It's people with corporate backing, it's people who hold political office. And some of the most elite writers and thinkers in the country are using their well-paid, well-protected pulpits to demonize people who don't have material power. 
In the process, they are manufacturing a new class of martyrs who lose no speech, no power, but lament its loss anyway. When people will say, people rush to cancel XYZ, people rush to have distaste for XYZ, um, and it's like, who are people? What do you mean by people, right? You look at the article, and it's a link to tweets or Instagram posts and XYZ. And that's how these headlines become so dramatic because instead of just embracing the greater narrative of what the harm is, what the big through line is, we tend to want to, you know, choose that we should give this level of countenance to disparate ideas as opposed to embracing the core narrative. What the coverage of cancel culture has done is flatten any and all semblance of critique or call for accountability into just one thing, being canceled. As a result of that flattening, the phrase cancellation implies that whatever criticisms are being lobbed at something are simply the product of the unhinged outrage of people unable to enjoy anything in life and who want to suppress your ability to say and do what you want. And it absolutely does not take into account how access to free speech is not equally distributed in this country, particularly along class, race, and gender lines. It is worth noting that almost half of Americans have heard the term cancel culture, and those most familiar with the term understand it as something meant to bring about accountability, not suppress free speech. Yet looking at how we discuss and cover so-called cancel culture, it's hard to see that. And this isn't a new or unique phenomenon. We see it time and time again with terms rooted in a demand for rethinking the status quo. Terms like PC, woke, and most recently critical race theory have been turned into dog whistles for outrage and disingenuous discourse decrying the destruction of American freedom. We've got to get down to the problems. We can't worry about being politically correct. A new piece of legislation for the upcoming legislative session called Stop Wrongs Against Our Kids and Employees Act, the Stop Woke Act. The next thing we know, the federal government has special training classes in critical race theory. How did it happen? To me, political correctness is tyranny, just tyranny with manners. It seems that a deteriorating society is exactly what political correctness strives for. None of this is to say that online bullying, harassment, and mob mentality don't exist. Of course they exist, and they exist beyond ideological constraints. A collection of people getting together to complain about something online behind the security of anonymity and digital distance is as old as an internet connection. The only difference today is the constant connectivity and the ease of access we have to one another and to those who were always before out of reach. But we have culturally conflated critique and calls for accountability with baseless outrage threatening free speech, ignoring the very real and violent ways that the First Amendment is being encroached upon, especially for those without material or social power. The people who need to worry are the people who are trying to work in some kind of local way to make things better, trying to organize and whose story gets yanked out of context and, and thrown up into the national picture. And that does include, to be really clear, many, many working faculty. I was a professor for 10 years. I taught history. I often taught history about fairly sensitive subjects related to, uh, you know, related to abortion or related to, to gender or related to religious violence. And I was worried that someone would take a clip of me on their cell phone and send it to Fox News and what would happen after that? Would my administration stand by me? I like to think they would, but we know there's plenty of examples where that didn't happen. So how can we tell the story differently? How can we talk about internet outrage, accountability, free speech, and changing social mores around acceptable public speech in a way that doesn't reduce everything to a term that's become reactionary? Well we can start with rethinking our use of the term cancel culture. Oh, look at that. It doesn't matter what the term is. It could be political correctness. It could be PC culture. It could be cancel culture. It could be outrage culture. We can change the word. Like the, the consequences aren't going to ever actually amount to the harm. The continued uncritical use of this term imagines a new, unique culture of public ostracization and not the evolution of an attitude that already existed, just made obnoxiously prevalent by how plugged in we are. A lot of people in the media are very online. We spend a lot of our time on Twitter searching for sources who are online all the time. Um, but if you talk to your neighbors, you know, if you talk to the people who you see on the train regularly or at the grocery store, 
are they actually thinking about that bad tweet that that person sent, right? Are they actually t thinking about, you know, what is actually happening in that one viral Twitter video? The constant use of the term and all the ensuing rants also specifically treat students on campuses across the country doing what they've always done, protest what they understand to be unjust and morally reprehensible, as a new phenomenon that promotes illiberal bubble thinking over critical engagement with different competing ideas. Because yes, institutions of higher learning have never created ideological bubbles in their entire existence. That is certainly not the point of the modern education system. There are places in America that are, in fact, deeply oppressive around ideological diversity, but they're not the left-wing colleges. They're the right-wing universities. They never get covered. The people who talk about universities endlessly, who talk about Yale endlessly and individual incidents in a Yale classroom or a Harvard dining hall or an Oberlin lecture center, they never look at these, these colleges that have uh, sort of uh, ideological oppression built into their bylaws. Additionally, we need to look at who is being held accountable in the court of public outrage and who is asking for accountability. Having students, for instance, protest someone's presence on their campus where they pay an exorbitant amount of money to stay in debt forever because this person may support policies and ideas that the students deem harmful to their community's existence isn't a violation of that person's free speech. It's an expression of the student's free speech. If we stop a Nazi from having a highly paid lecture on a college campus, that does not mean we will necessarily stop everyone else who is also a little bit controversial. We can discern the difference between a Nazi and someone who merely disagrees with us about tax policy or you know the, the role of marriage in society or plenty of other controversial things. We can discern the difference there. And often the people who are pushing cancel culture as a big national problem say that we can't discern the difference and that's just not true. Additionally, there need to be clear demarcations between online bullying, legitimate critiques of people or institutions, and the internet just being itself. Treating these things as all the same is not only dishonest, but undermines attempts at accountability in particular. In a 2016 CBS This Morning interview, comedian Bo Burnham made an observation about cancel culture. He said that while the pendulum seems to be swinging in some extreme ways, it will self-correct, as it always has, and land somewhere sustainable. For me, it's an overcorrection for a serious problem like bigotry and racism. And yeah, they've swung the other way. And yeah, they're a little irony deaf, but I'll take like an irony deaf tolerant crowd over a racist crowd that really understands the workings of comedy and irony. Rarely do we find earnest engagement with the way a more connected culture has brought about a greater exchange of ideas and a revisitation of our collective beliefs on how we live and coexist. We're arguably overall more perceptive and open to re-examining injustices. Take, for example, the public response to the killing of George Floyd and the reckoning with sexual assault and harassment of women in the workplace. Yet on issues of speech, there's a greater tendency toward being reactionary. So if you think about kind of the American story, it does come back to American individualism and American entitlement to land and property and personhood. So that's how we get here where there's this inherent reflexive denial of what any sense of accountability of what cancel culture should or is or what this contemporary definition of it should be. And that's how you have that through line from the legacy of American you know, arrival to these lands and these shores to what we have now. The irony is that by failing to accurately cover issues of free speech, by being unable or perhaps unwilling to differentiate between accountability and bullying and repressive practices, we end up creating more restrictive speech for all. We can't stop just where the story is out there, the story is a big deal. We have to keep following what happens next. Who actually loses their job? Who gets a, a strongly worded letter of reprimand or maybe has to stop teaching a particular class for one semester, but nothing really changes? Who keeps their newspaper columns? And who experiences long-term consequences for rocking the boat? I think it's my responsibility as a cultural reporter to, to ask, why is this happening? When is this happening? How, why are we embracing this term and letting other people dictate to us this shift. We have our own level of power here as people who work on detailing and archiving our own snapshot of history. And that's something that we should work to take care of and have a level of, um, of accountability for in our own right. 
our current coverage of free speech and our sculpting of cancel culture actually ends up constructing any and all speech deviating from a certain status quo as destructive. And what's free about that? Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching. We really wanted to get into a little bit of that nitty gritty when it comes to the contradictions inherent in the cancel culture discourse. Uh, and we want you to be really a part of this conversation as we're exploring different topics in media coverage and how they're discussed and how we can tell that story better. So let us know in the comments what you thought. Feel free to cancel me and enjoy these eggs. Look at them. They're just there. What's in them? Maybe you'll find out. Maybe you won't. If you want to find out, subscribe. We'll see you soon.